So I actually took it upon myself. I said, screw that. I, I got, I started networking right away because I came from a larger city. That's what we did. We networked. So mm -hmm. found out who's in charge of county, got with them and I actually organized, um, we need a forensic meeting. Like, do you guys have these? I'm like, no. I'm like, well, let's organize one. My name is Gabby. I'm brand new, but I want to meet all of you and let's get it going. Hey there. My name's Ashley Church. And I'm Erin West. We were once newly promoted crime scene and latent print supervisors on mutual struggle buses as we both simultaneously tried to navigate through the challenges within our forensic units. Now we run a business where we create tools and resources that we wish we had had to make these transitions easier. We like to talk about the experiences we've had in the forensic field, the good, the bad, and the ugly, in the hopes to create awareness around these issues and move the needle forward to create positive change in the forensic community. So if you're a forensic professional, regardless of your years of experience, who's not afraid to dive into real, raw, and sometimes uncomfortable topics, you're in the right place. This is the Forensics Unfiltered Podcast. Hey, it's Ashley, and today we have a special episode recorded during the 2023 International Association for Identification Conference. We had the privilege of sitting down with Gabrielle Weimer, a seasoned forensic professional who has worked in both large and small forensic units. Gabby is also the host of the popular podcast, The Walls Do Talk, and was a speaker at our Forensic Trainer Symposium earlier this year. In this episode, Gabrielle shares her unique experiences, the pros and cons of working in different size forensic units, and how collaboration with nearby agencies can enhance knowledge, training, and resource sharing. With the 2024 IAI conference just two months away in August, we hope to see many of you there. Before we start this episode, our guests would like to share a disclaimer that the opinions shared are their own and not representative of their current or past employment. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy. All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of Forensics Unfiltered. We are actually in a, a different location. Uh, we are at the IAI conference, and we are fortunate enough to have Gabby from the Walls Do Talk podcast come and do a little interview today. So yes. thanks thank, for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited because I'm a big fan. <laughs> <laughs> we are excited as well. All right, so for people that have not uh, listened to the Walls Do Talk podcast or maybe have not seen your name around before, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do, where you're from, all the good things? Definitely. Um, so my name is Gabby, and I have a podcast called The Walls Do Talk, and it's a true crime podcast because, you know, everyone always says like, hey, what's the craziest shit you've ever seen? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I thought I want to really bring people into my world, into the world of crime scene investigation. And so I want them to feel like you're right there with me when we're walking through a crime scene and everything I've smelt and felt and heard and done. So that's the podcast side of things. On the professional side of things, I am a crime scene investigator. I've been doing it for about 13 years now. And I also do latent print examination. And I work for a smaller agency in the northern part of Southern California, I guess. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I've been doing it since 2010. I absolutely love it. And... And here we are, yes. enjoying the IAI. Yes, <laughs> it has been quite the conference. And you've had the unique experience, which not everybody gets to experience throughout their career, but of kind of moving from a larger agency into a smaller agency. Is that right? Yes, definitely. In 2010, I started with my larger agency and it was great. I had like a big team. There was about eight of us on there. And so I really got to dive in and just had that whole team mentality. As my life grew and our family grew, um, we decided to relocate to um, a city about two hours north of there into a much smaller agency. But it was after about six years, six years of experience in the field and this agency had an opening and it was, hey, we don't have a legit crime scene team and we're looking for two people to come build this unit. From so, scratch. From scratch. Oh, that's gosh. hard. Yeah, that's hard. Yeah, so I thought, all right, let's do it. I, I put in for it and I got it and along with another um, individual who had about the same amount of experience as me. So there was two of us only. That can be a, a challenge. A journey. Yeah. It's yeah, a journey and eye opener. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's a lot to unpack, but. 
<laughs> just like the logistics of like, all right, now you got to develop a whole training program. I don't know if you've had experience doing that before. And then like writing SOPs and what are your processes? What's the budget? What kind of resources can you have? And that type of thing on top of like the challenge of it, it's just two people, right? Right. right. Yeah. It, was, it was one of those, um, like the sergeant that interviewed me or the panel that interviewed me, the sergeant that day called me back about two hours later. And he's like, you want the job? Just like casual like that. I, like, I, I don't, excuse me. And yeah. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, it's yours if you want it. Do you want it? And I'm like, what do you, I, I don't even know what I'm getting into. Need more into. details. Yeah. And my supervisor at the time at my large unit, she was like, are you sure you want to fucking take this on? Cause this is a lot. And I was like, I don't know. But I went, I, I met with them and I said, look, I don't know what I'm getting into. I know that I'm skilled. I know that I can do something for this department, but you need to make me two promises. He's like, okay. I'm like, don't ever deny training because we fucking need to train. He's yeah. Like, okay. I'm like, and buy me whatever I say. You know, if I need it, <laughs> you get to buy it. He's and did like, they agree to that? Because that's agreed. pretty. That's pretty yeah. amazing. Yeah, they agreed. I mean, I'm not gonna say we need this. You know, yeah, three hundred thousand yeah. dollar equipment thing. But he said, yes, we will get you. Just like we need our own VMD. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God! Could you imagine? <laughs> He's like, or what are we doing here? Yeah. <laughs> we know we're not really cool. I can put like, you know. Yeah, <laughs> that's desk. awesome. Metal desk, gold desk. It's great. No, but he was like, sure. I don't, he's like, I don't understand your field. I don't know your field. We rely on you. So whatever equipment you need and whatever training you need, we're here for you. We've had that same mentality throughout these last few years that I've been there. So that's really great to have that so kind fun. of support from your department. Yes. So I will say that there's probably pros and cons to both sides, both working at a large department and working at a small department. So from your own experience of being able to work at both, what were some of the benefit, like pros and cons of a large department versus your pros and cons you've experienced at a smaller department? Have you heard about The Vault? It's the first ever membership exclusively for forensic training, and we have packed it full of goodies. So get this you get instant access to over 20 webinar replays on everything from landing a job in forensics to field training to supervision. But that's not all. We're also throwing in some of our top e-courses, our field training officer virtual academy, and exclusive forensic supervisor success kits from past virtual summits. And guess what? You get everything mentioned for just $29 a month, or you can grab a whole year for only $300. And we know many forensic professionals lately are paying for their own training. So we want to make sure training is affordable and accessible for everyone. There is fresh content every month, and that also makes it an endless learning opportunity for you. So it's a no brainer. Join the vault today and be part of the forensic education revolution. I'll include the link in our show notes, or you can head to our website to learn more. Don't miss out. Unlock your potential with the vault. So from your own experience of being able to work at both, what were some of the benefit, like pros and cons of a large department versus your pros and cons you've experienced at a smaller department? Definitely. So I guess right off the bat, pros less red tape. The -hmm. smaller department was not familiar with crime scene unit and what needs to be done. They were very, they welcomed us with open arms. So I'm like, I need to implement this training. I need to implement these SOPs and I need patrol to start doing this. And I need this equipment. They're like, okay. It was a simple, send me an email. Okay. Okay. Or let me put something together for the chief. Okay. It wasn't like, yeah, well, I don't know. That's not really on my list of things to do right now. Um, that's what I experienced at our old department. Like getting a change implemented was like moving mountains. It had to have yeah. memos and paperwork where I knew it wasn't something bad. It was something that needed to be in, but it was just, okay, let's do it. For instance, I had an amazing internship program down in San Diego PD. Absolutely amazing. Very hands-on. They let us go to homicide scenes. We got to process actual evidence. At my old agency, that'd be like, yeah, probably not gonna happen. The agency I'm at now, they're like, sure, put it together, whatever you wanna do. So stuff like that, that has been pros. Cons, there's only two of us. Yeah. And so there would be times where our partner's sick or they're on vacation or they'd be gone for three weeks or COVID hit. And it's like, I think I was on my own for six weeks. 
Um, there were times where I worked two homicides by myself in one day, big homicides. Um, and there was just no getting around that. So did I make mistakes? Yeah. If I would have had someone there watching me, would I have made those mistakes? Probably not. Cause I would have had an extra set of hands, eyes, brain there to pick up the slack, yeah. identify things that I wasn't identifying. Um, so you don't have that, you don't have that support that you do with a bigger team. Did you guys ever work crime scenes by yourself? Uh, I mean, there like were situations, majors? yeah, yeah situations homicides, where yeah. no one mm-hmm. else is available and that's, you know. You just do your best. You just do your best, yeah. I will say, it seems like they were fortunate enough to have someone with your skill set and also someone that was proactive and like, I'm just going to ask for things because a right. lot of people are really shy. Yes. And again, this may be a little bit controversial and it's not to throw shade at anything, but like, should that be happening in law enforcement agencies where they just decide one day, like, I want to have a forensic unit and um, they and just randomly select someone yeah. for it. Right. I mean, we've had departments in our area where they have decided to make a crime scene unit and told like a secretary, like you are the crime scene unit now, here's your kit and off you go. Right. So, And that is unfortunate because my police department, thank goodness, yeah, they had our commander, who's our commander now, he has a degree, a master's in forensic science. So he had a little bit of understanding and he was on the board. So he knew like if you were bullshitting or not, like if you knew your stuff or you didn't, and he did know that he wanted someone with experience with at least processing homicides to come in and do this. So they had that gumption. Thank goodness. The girl that came in, we had the same experience. So it was a great fit. And we were really able to tackle the, the idea and the project of building this unit. Yeah. But coming to this conference, touching base with people and still hearing stories they're like, yeah, well, they just gave the new forensic spot to the, like you said, fucking secretary has been here for 20 years and she wants to try crime scene and yeah. and they're like that's great we don't want to ever deny someone but like do we have the resources to build someone from the ground up do they necessarily even know they're going to make it or enjoy this you know here's a late print card to even make a match oh it's a match all right that's good no, yeah it's- i mean we do have a lot of people that get into this field not fully understanding what they're getting into just because they like love true crime like i I literally had someone on a job application the other day applied for our forensic position and they have to write an essay about why they want the job. And she was like, I love true crime. That's why I want to work here. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. (laughs) don't put that on your essays, guys. (laughs) But I think it's interesting talking about, you know, some of the pros and cons about the larger departments versus the smaller departments where the smaller departments, you have a lot more flexibility of Mm -hmm. movement and change and progressiveness, larger departments. And that is very much sure. I found that to be the case too, that larger departments, it's a lot harder to move forward and make change because of all of the the bureaucracy of it, you know, all the processes that have to go on just to change a simple policy or things like that. So one of the the things we've talked about in the past is like, should we collaborate or consolidate these services? And instead of, you know, you having a little bit of resources and a little bit of training and the agency right next to you having a lot of resource and a lot of training, would it benefit us all more if to, you know, to serve our community and for ourselves too, our own professional growth and everything and our own skills and knowledge to actually be one large team that comes together and pools resources as opposed to us all trying to do the same thing at separate levels in the same exact area. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that? You know, I think that is great because it was an eye-opening experience on on that subject in particular. My first agency was tapped into a large county. That county would provide training and equipment. They had a special funding board called the RAND board. That RAND board money was specifically used for identification purposes. Any Anybody within that county that needed equipment or training that could relate to identification Um, could tap into it. So to this day, I still know they provide every agency within that county. I mean, a DCS imaging pie, like, you know, fostering free. Everybody's got one. Yeah. A super glue tank. (laughs) Yeah. Imaging system, training, sponsorship here to the IAI for free. Their county doesn't have to 
their, their agency, their city agency doesn't have to pay for any of that. It's funded by the larger county, which I think is absolutely amazing. They hold training where they invite two people from each agency for free. I mean, it may have changed a little bit, but as far as one or at least two people from each agency can go to training, can go to conferences, can receive equipment for free provided through the county, through the special funding. So when I got to my county, I'm like, all right, what's a board meeting? When do we meet? And they're like, the what? <laughs> okay. okay. I was like, cool. All right. Um, I do latent prints. I'm like, where's our APHIS terminal? Oh, only county has an APHIS terminal. I'm like, wait, what do you mean county is the only one to access an APHIS terminal? Like, they're the only ones that do latents. I'm like, but what about like our other two neighboring agencies that are small, but they have latent print examiners. I'm like, yeah, but, but they don't have equipment to do it. So they, they can't. Oh, that's bullshit. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, well, the, the Rand board should be paying for this. And they're like, the what? What? So I actually took it upon myself. I said, screw that. I, I got, I started networking right away because it came from a larger city. That's what we did. We networked. So mm -hmm. found out who's in charge of county, got with them, found out in charge, um, who was in charge of the smaller agencies around. And I actually organized, um, we need a forensic meeting. Like, do you guys have these? And I was like, no. I'm like, well, let's organize one. My name is Gabby. I'm brand new, but I want to meet all of you and let's get it going. So I got that going. And then I said, hey, I think that Ventura Police Department needs um, a investigation. And so does our other two neighboring agencies. They need one because they're lame print examiners. I'm like, well, we have no money for that. I'm like, you're not going to pay for it. The county's going to pay for it. And we made that happen. <laughs> She's took a confident about, woman. Yeah, it took about a year and year and a half, but everyone, the chief's like, we can get this for free. I'm like, for free. So we did. We ended up getting another agency one, um, and our my agency one, and um, so we kind of got the ball rolling. Like I thought, wait a second, how come you guys are not funding these smaller agencies with money and training? It just not like they're meant to be hoarding, but no one ever just thought like, let's start, let's connect, and let's. That's Get awesome that you didn't take it, like, you, you just accepted it and you're like, oh, okay, well, I guess we'll just work with what we got, which I feel like, like your experience for what you were able to accomplish in connecting all these agencies together, I feel like that's abnormal. You know, I worked at counties and a lot of the times, like, we didn't even, I didn't talk to or know anyone from the local police departments, right. which is kind of foolish of us as a forensic field like we're purposely stunting our growth and we're not really working our cases to the best of our abilities because we're only working within the limits of our own agencies instead right. of us all pulling resources together right. so that we can provide the same services because I know Aaron said it before like just because we have an imaginary line for our jurisdiction like you know the criminals, the criminals don't care. Don't care. Right. They're going from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And I feel like we could be way more effective as a science if we, you know, kind of came together. Yeah, I agree. And we've seen some different ways that this plays out. Like yours is a great example where you're tapping into a resource that has obviously benefited you and the other agencies you brought with you into that. Right. And I feel like the Los Angeles area and the California area are pretty good about having like regular meetings where the supervisors all come together. Like we've gone to a lot of different states where that's not happening at all. I think in Arizona or was it, or maybe it was Utah, we saw an example of where they all pulled their resources into one large unit and that unit was responding to anything each of the individual cities needed. So okay. they all were working as one large unit, all had the same training, all using the same equipment, and then they were responding to all of their city's needs, which I really liked the idea of that. That was the first time that yeah. we had gone somewhere where we had seen something like that and then at least every single forensic professional like it was the same training program they're using yeah. the same equipment they're same responding processes. in the same way yeah no matter which city agency that was so that was neat too yeah. so and so i think what you just described i think is what i believe might be taboo but what osax is trying to establish what our nation is trying to establish if we had just you know i think yeah. it's a great idea have one hub, same training equipment, you know, everyone's gonna be working to the same standard. It's holding accountability and standards. Yeah. Um, and then providing that service to all. So now being at a smaller agency and oftentimes it's just me, 
Mm -hmm. Um, For the last six months, seven months, it was just me. And now I have a brand new person and she's great, but she's still green and brand new. Mm -hmm. So it technically is still just me because if she's out there to see. Absolutely. It's still you. She won't be with her. (laughs) Yeah. I do that. I'm fucking up. She'll be like, oh, it's good to me. You know? Yeah. I don't have that checks and balance. (laughs) I have a sergeant who's amazing. He's. He can talk with him. He'll get me whatever I need. He's there for me. But he doesn't know anything about standards. Yeah. And the way my report should look. And Not uncommon. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> I'm always like, yeah, you know. Like I yeah. am my own checks and balance, and that's not good. No, I don't. I I really don't think it should be allowed to happen. Heck no! Like there should always be something. Someone is verifying your work. Yeah. Like even for latent print examiners, if they for are sure. at an agency, yeah. they're the only person. They still have to send their work to be verified by someone, right. like in a, in the county or a next county over or something like yeah. that. Right. But the crime scene world. Oh, that doesn't happen. Like, you know, yeah. it's felt there wrong. I'm like, oh, yeah. You know, but it's not <laughs> yeah. like, wait, what yeah. happened to the process of all these? It's, it's even kind of wild how different our departments all are. Like, this comes up a lot in our trainings, too, where based on the agency that I work for, I may have been sent to, I may have gone through a really good uh, training program, mm-hmm. a really comprehensive training program, and then also have the opportunity to go to a lot of trainings. But then we'll see, you know, departments where they have no training program at all so that they're not supporting their people by, you know, teaching them what they're supposed to be doing. But then they also go to like one training in a blue moon, like once in a blue moon. And so we'll see a lot of people that are, I mean, Layton's is a perfect example. You do Layton's too, but we've met a lot of people who are like, yep, they sent me to, they wanted Layton's. They sent me to a 40 hour class. I'm the Layton examiner now. And you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we've had people in our classes who were never even sent to training who were like, well, someone showed me how to use APHIS and I do all the latent comparisons now, which is not, which, which does not make you a latent examiner. But you don't know what you don't know. For sure. So the tiny departments with these one or two people that, you know, Mm -hmm. and you know, maybe they did have someone that was really proficient, but then they retired all that experience goes out the door. And they're just kind of left to their own devices. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's it's scary. It shouldn't it be happening. Like we know better. Right. You know what I mean? We do know better. These yeah. Are people's lives we're dealing with. Like, what, yeah. What we do for have, sure. Are major effects on people's lives. So yeah. I miss working in a large agency. I think having like a central hub in each county or state or however it work to work all that. I think that's a, would be an amazing idea. Yeah. yeah. I don't see agencies like we're not going to give up our scene you know that's our it's kind of an ego thing yeah it is and it's really like let them get absorbed (laughs) let us create this world you know yeah units and yeah i think it's good i think the the few examples we haven't seen a lot of examples of it as we've traveled the country to teach but the few that we've seen it does seem to kind of standardize it out for everybody that's in that area that everybody's producing a pretty similar work product in those areas. I think the one way that I've tried to keep myself accountable, stay abreast of important topics and trending and new concepts and ideas, rules, standards, is that I've always um, kept my bridges and my contacts. Yes. Since being even my internship, I actually got to see two ladies here that I was their intern and they sat in heard me speak and I said, stand up, you're some of the reason I'm here. And it was just came full circle. But I still reach out to them. I'm like, hey, can I get that manual that we had? You know, have you guys updated it? I know you guys are accredited now. Give me your training manual. Give me your processing manual. Give me this. And then I still keep in touch with all my people in LA because I know they're held to a high standard. I'm like, let me see all your stuff. You know, yeah. I keep that. I pull because I'm like, and then even the county I'm working with today, I have a great relationship. I'm going to give her a shout out. Denise Hernandez. Like, we love Denise. We yes. love Denise. <laughs> Denise, we love you. <laughs> we love Denise. So I'm always like, can I have a copy of these reports? You can redact whatever, but I want to make sure that you guys are accredited. You guys are, you're, as far as um, your latent print examiners and your reports, I know you guys are all um, certified. I want to see how you're writing reports. I want to make sure my reports are mirroring yours. We are, you are the county, you are, you are our lead, essentially. So I feel like the county and that agency I'm looking to you. I'm a smaller agency, so I want to be aligned with that. I want to be aligned with everything LA County is doing. Is 
just make sure I'm I'm doing things right because yeah, I have yeah. nobody well, to props say. Props to you for even yeah. asking because I think that that's not always the case. You know, yeah. I mean, you had the opportunity when you started there; it didn't exist, and you could have made it whatever you wanted it to be, and nobody would have checked you because right. at your department, who's going to know? Like right. you're nobody you're the one making the decision. So you could have taken that a totally different path, and there are a lot of supervisors out there I think that are too prideful to reach out and say like, hey, I don't know, or I need help or whatever it is. So, I mean, props to you for, for yeah. doing that to make your unit the best that it can be for sure. Well, anything else you want to share? Anything else you want to tell the um, audience? Oh my gosh. No, I'm just, I'm excited. Thank you so much. I'm mean, even my husband back home is like, you better call me girl. And that's exactly <laughs> how I went because he knows how excited I am. The hubs is following again. us too. <laughs> Love he it. is my manager. He's always like, did you post? Did you get this? Did you create? I'm like, I'm networking. <laughs> I'm working on it. Working it's on very it, yeah. hard to, like, I know our page is, you know, we, you do what you can, but the conference is, it's, it's yeah. busy. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's busy. Fun. I know. So I'm like, I felt this high, high, high. I was like, whoa. And then come Wednesday, I was like, oh my gosh. I'm, I'm tired. Yeah, 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 I'm tired. <laughs> replenish. I still got a couple more days, but I'm excited because I want to have you on my podcast. And I know that we had some questions and things we talked about earlier, but I want to save that because I l think your content is important. It's valuable. It's original. People can relate to it. And we all have so many questions for you. And we're just like... <laughs> I know my Because I don't divulge enough on my we're, Yeah. yeah. <laughs> on we're my ready for it, girl. <laughs> you better get ready because y'all keep it very surf. I mean, I don't know, maybe in your classes or in your summits or you have your one-on-ones, but you guys keep it funny and surface informative, but I go a little bit deeper and I'm going to pull out like emotions and the whys and how the fuck did you get here and do it? Because there's a lot of us like, yeah. how did you do it? <laughs> we, wanna, we can't wait. We want to do it. So we're an open book. So. Yeah. <laughs> But that's it. Oh, so that's great. You. So where can they reach out to you if they want some more of Gabby? Right. Some more of Gabby. Um, log on to your Instagram and look for the Walls Do Talk podcast. You can also go to the walsdotalk.com. You can send me messages there. You can email me. I'm going to leave my email right now. It's yeah. my full name, Gabrielle Weimer, G-A-B-R-I-E-L-L-E-W-I-M-E-R at gmail.com. Awesome. And, um, so yeah, that's and all of me. those links I'll make sure to include yeah. in the show notes below. Right. So <laughs> they could just click and go to yeah. your website or go to your page. Yeah. So, and you can listen to the, the uh, podcast on Spotify. That's where we find it. The walls do talk. So well, we're looking forward to the next episode. And of course we'll let everyone know when that airs on the walls do talk podcast. So we yes. can, we can have more fun chats. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Appreciate thanks, it. guys. Bye. 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 <laughs> Thank you so much for being here and listening to Forensics Unfiltered. If you liked this episode, would you do us a favor and leave a review letting us know specifically what you liked about this topic? It will only take a minute, but it will really help us plan future episodes so we can bring you more topics that you want to listen to. We'll be sure to provide any links from today's episode in our show notes on our website. Head to www.gapscience.com. Until next time, stay safe out there.